If you are here for the very first time, would you raise your hand for us tonight? Just raise your hand. We want to know your social security number. We want your bank. No, no. Let's just give them a welcome tonight. Can we do that? Amen. No, the government wants to know your social security number. We don't. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about In the News. And I put one right above New Order Old Order because it's extremely important and it's very, very biblically uh, sound on prophecy what's happening. This article just kind of hit me today when I read it. And it says this, did the beast of Revelation and the whore of Babylon meet over Jerusalem recently? Playing the uh, first Vatican visit by a Turkish Paying the first Vatican visit by a Turkish head of state in 59 years, President uh, Erdogan met with Pope Francis on February 5th, 2018. These two prominent world leaders met to discuss several sensitive pro geopolitical issues, which included at the top of their list the current and future state of Jerusalem. Now, why the Vatican cares about Jerusalem and why a Turkish president cares about Jerusalem, you should, you should put your antennas up a little bit. Mentioned by 70 different names over 1,000 times in the Bible, this holy city is central to Islam, Catholicism, and Ju Judaism and Christianity. President Donald Trump's decision on December 6, 2017 to acknowledge Jerusalem as Israel's capital sends shockwaves throughout the, both the Muslim and Catholic communities. Uh, representing nearly 3 billion followers between them, these two dominant world religions are apparently uniting together against President Trump's controversial Jerusalem decision. Does this developing alliance between Turkey and the Vatican have potential biblical ramifications? Well, according to the New York Times bestseller author Joel Ro uh, Richardson, it very well may. Uh, in his book entitled Mid Middle East Beast, the, the scriptural case for Islamic Antichrist, Richardson presents a strong case for an Islamic Antichrist that arises out of Turkey. Now again, remember this is his theory. Uh, recently, Richardson collaborated with Bill Salas, another noted prophecy expert, to produce a truly historic DVD that takes an all-in-depth look, at uh, prophetic look, at the futures of Islam and Roman Catholicism. Uh, Bill Sellis takes the position that the Catholic Church will fulfill the role of coming global religion of the last days. Sallis argues that Rome is the great city of mystery Babylon, mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, this is going out all over the internet, so I'm going to get a lot of hate mail from this. This is not my article. This is their article. So just listen to it all the way down the line and be open-minded, all right? And the uh, woman who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth, Revelation 17, 18. According to both Richardson and Sallis, the Bible clearly predicts the formation of an unholy alliance between the coming character charismatic leader called the Beast, and the future global religion referred to as Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of all the earth. Both authors have concern, have, are, are concerned that the Mystery of Babylon is about to become the religious reality thrust upon the world, and, uh, and that the final status of Jerusalem may play a key role in this process. And of course it will, and I agree with that. Uh, in addition to aligning itself with the Antichrist, the coming harlot, world religion, will rule over many nations, that's Revelation 17.15, be headquartered in the great city, that's Revelation 17.18, be a city located on seven hills, that's Revelation 17.9. If you know anything about Rome, it's located on seven hills. Uh, some people believe that that's seven continents of the world. So, again, there's lots of theories on it. Rendered, uh, pandered to the world's political leaders, Revelation 17.2, become the religious opiate of the masses, Revelation 17.2, eventually be hated by the ten kings, that's Revelation 17:6. Be desolate by those ten uh, political. Be desolated by those ten political leaders. Revelation 17:16, and be replaced by the Antichrist global system, which is Revelation 17:17. 17, 17. Richardson and Salas debate which city best meets the description of these prophetic details. Among the five primary candidate cities, which include Jerusalem, New York City, and uh, rebuilt Babylon in Iraq, uh, Joel and Bill narrow it down to two most likely cities of Mecca or Rome being the Babylon city. Salas disagrees with the Islamic Antichrist and harlot theories presented by Richardson, which makes for a lively and educational three-hour discussion on the DVD. According to Joel Richardson, Islam, with its 1.8 billion followers, is the most logical candidate to become the dominant world religion in the last days. However, Salas reasons that Allah is about to lose his Akbar, which means, he cla <laughs> which means his claims of being the greatest god. Salas points out that approximately 600 to 700 million Muslims could soon be killed, captured, or exiled as a result of two major prophetic wars. Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 are unfulfilled biblical predictions that deal with the epic Middle East uh, and uh, the battles that are there. Psalm 83 includes an inner circle of Muslim countries that share common borders with Israel. Salas explains how these countries are defeated by the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF. He claims the IDF victory over the inner circle of Arab countries and related terrorist groups is a punch 
in the gut of Islam. Let me give you my take. My take is this. God wins. He always wins. And Israel's on the side of God and it's a promise to them that they will win. So yes, there's trouble coming. Whether we know who exactly is the Antichrist, I have my theories. Everybody has their theories. Uh, but basically, let me remind you, their theories. God knows what's going to happen. Aren't you glad that God knows what's going to happen beyond us? All right, let me give you a little bit more that's going on in the news from uh, New World Order, or one of our categories, and tell you something about this. This is time to crack down on facial recognition. I knew this had to come sooner or later because we are so uh, hot and bothered with facial recognition around the world. It says at least a half of American adults have their photo and facial recognition network that authorities can search without a court order or meaningful privacy protections. That's a whopping 175 million people. So turn to the person to your left. Turn to the person to your right. Uh, hopefully you had somebody on your left and your right. Um, at least one and a half of them have their faces recognized in some database. So we can safely say that half of us here tonight have our faces recognized in some database. But that finding by Georgetown University researchers who dubbed the networks a perpetual lineup in, to, is in late 2016 generated little legislative activity. So the uh, legislature didn't really get bothered by the fact that there's a half of Americans that have facial recognition in databases somewhere in America. Uh, Al Alvaro Bedway, a Georgetown law professor who helped write the report, says he knows of a single, just one lawmaker, Maryland State Dele uh, Delegate Charles Sindor, who took up his call for regulating official use of facial recognition tools. Sindor, a Baltimore County Democrat, later gave up that bill, which would require police to get a court order to search databases of driver's license photos. I think that's a great bill. I think that should happen. It, was, it, was, it died in committee last year. Some privacy advocacies said, advocates say, however, that the issue's time has come and that regulations are needed as states write rules for the emerging technologies such as drones and cell site simulators. So what they're saying is this, is it's about time we do something to regulate all this facial recognition. Because if you walk down the street in any major city, uh, there may be drones overhead that takes your face and has a recognition and knows exactly where you are. So it's an invasion of privacy and it's happening without any type of, without any type of regulation. And obviously, sooner or later, some regulation has to come. I'm really concerned that the government has so much information on all of us. Amen. I'm very concerned at that. Let me give you another one for the New World Order. Uh, Adahar, card for children below five years of age, is launched by UDAI. That's U-I-D-A-I. Unique Identify, Identification Authority of India. India is on top of this thing. India has a billion people. They have numbered every single one of them. And now they're going beyond their adults and they're going down to their children. Now watch what this says. They're in a massive database in India. Uh, they, they, today, they, interested a, they introduced a bail, B-A-A-L, right from the Bible, Adahar card for children below the age of five years. No biometric details will be required to get this blue colored bail Adahar card. A child below five years of age gets a blue uh, colored Adahar known as bail Adahar. When the child becomes five years old, a mandatory biometric update is required. However, a mandatory biometric update is required also when they're 15 years old. For this update, which is free, parents can take their child to any nearby Adahar center. And this is a quote, remember to update biometric Adahar data of your child at the age of five, and then again at the age of 15 years. This mandatory biometric update for children is free. Of course it's free, because they're numbering their society. And let me tell you something, they're setting the pace for numbering. If you can number a billion people in an almost third world country, how many of you know you can do it in a more advanced country? So it's coming. It's definitely coming. Let me give you a little bit more on Israel, what's happening there. U.S. considers offer from Sheldon Adelson to fund the Jerusalem embassy move. Lawyers with the State Department are considering an offer from Sheldon Adelson, the billionaire casino mogul, one of the largest donors of the Republican pol politics, to fund the construction of a new U.S. embassy in Jerusalem. Adelson has long supported the move, and he conditioned his donations to the 2016 Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump, on his vow to execute on a once-empty campaign promise from past presidents. He said, before Trump got elected, if there's a president that will move the embassy, I will pay for the embassy. And so basically that embassy, but, and this is the new news that came out today, and I'll say two articles in this. One is right here. That embassy will be officially opened in a limited capacity this May. So May it's going to. It's going to coincide. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a 60 year, a 60 year kind of battle for it. Time with Israel's 70th celebration of independence. This is all prophetic, friends. In, in refurbished consular uh, facility in Arnona, 
And so, uh, visiting Israel last month, Vice President Mike Pence had predicted that move would take place at the end of 2019, but it's way ahead of schedule. Uh, moving the embassy to Jerusalem is expected to cost at least $500 million, but obviously they already have people backing to pay it. Let me give you the other article that confirms this. U.S. confirms Jerusalem embassy opening in May. The Trump administration will officially re relocate its U.S. embassy from Israel, in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in May. So that means the trip we're taking in, in uh, September, we're going to pass by where the embassy is. I'm I'm already telling the guys that are doing our trip we want to go by the embassy and so uh, so we'll see that embassy you'll be you'll be probably some of the first people on the trips that will be seeing this embassy the official was responded to a message on Twitter by Transportation Minister Israel Kantz who seemed to be to confirm the move would occur in the spring uh, so we're planning to open the new embassy to Israel in Jerusalem in May the US official told the post the embassy opening will coincide with Israel's 70th anniversary uh, will initially be located in Arnona on a compound that currently houses the consular operations of Consulate General Jerusalem. Uh, it will consist of an ambassador, so we'll actually have an ambassador in Jerusalem and a small team of Americans, so it's pretty amazing. Along with that, Israel obviously realizes that there's always war on their borders, there's always some type of threat, so they successfully tested their Arrow 3 missile defense system this week. Um, the Defense Ministry announced in a tweet the accomplishment capping a program that's, see, that's seen a series of delays and cancellations. It was supposed to go up. The Arrow 3 interceptor was launched and carried out its mission. Uh, the test came after several aborted attempts in recent months. In January, it was aborted. In December, it was aborted. The experiment we conducted today was very complex. Boaz Leve, uh, Levy, Deputy CEO of Israeli space, Aerospace Industries and manager of its systems, missiles, and space group, said in a statement, in the experiment, the interceptor simulated a full military scenario and the rocket did the route in full. And if it had been a real target, it would have taken it out. We are very pleased with the results. Israel Aerosp Aerospace Industries worked together with Boeing to develop the Arrow 3. And by the way, the Arrow 3 is supposed to be one of the most sophisticated uh, anti-missile weaponry in the, on the planet. So it could take si out sidewinding missiles, which you'll hear in a moment when we talk about Russia. Let me get a little bit more and let's go to the economy. This is the same chip we talk about. You can see the size of it. Federal Reserve pick proponent of chipping cash to track and tax. Now listen to this real closely because I told you I'm very much in support of Donald Trump, whatever he does for Israel. Sometimes I think he needs to take a better look at some of the other things he's doing. How many are with me? I'm not going to give him just a clean slate. Come on, somebody. I think the only reason he's in the office is for Israel, to be honest with you. And so he's doing some other great things, but some things he's doing he needs to really think about. Uh, let me give you this one. In the state's relentless pursuit to scrutinize and control every citizen, including monitoring, tracking, and especially taxing their income, uh, untraceable physical cash has long been a shield against such tyranny. So if you have cash and you're hoarding it at home, which a lot of people do because you have negative interest rates in banks, um, basically your cash has a strip in it. Uh, that strip was developed by a certain man, I'll read it to you in a moment. And the reason that strip was developed is because it can be, and this is not in the article, I'm just telling you, it can be read from space. So, which means that if you, unless you have your cash in a, your cash in a lead container, uh, it could be read from space. Now, why would they do that? Well, we know of drug dealers that had warehouses full of cash in the 1980s in Miami. And so their premise is, if somebody's hoarding cash, whether it's terrorists or drug acts, we can, we can pass over and see all the strips. So it's an it's a identification system. But there may be another sinister reason why they have it. If the nomination to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors is successful, the Federal Board of Governors, Federal Reserve Board of Governors, that nomination's up, anonymous purchases, deposits, and savings with cash could soon be thing, a thing of the past. In November 2017, central banking proponent of the Keynesian economics, uh, you heard me talk about that, Marvin Goodfried was nominated by President Donald Trump to fill one of the vacancies on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. I don't think Trump knows exactly why he nominated this guy. I think it was just the name given to him. Because if he knows what he's talking about, if he knew it's what we're going to tell you, he probably wouldn't have. He was then confirmed by the U.S. Senate Banking Committee to, in advance, or to advance. Goldfried is a central banking insider who spent decades moving in and out of government and central banks, and his ideas are nothing short of Orwellian controlling. Uh, while his resume may make, make the, him seem like a qualified member of the corrupt and insidious Federal Reserve System, he's proposed and openly advocated for one of the most horrific plans of a free society has ever seen, tracking cash. So uh, Reuters reports that uh, he's, being, he's being nominated for the wrong reason. Goodfried's idea was to insert the magnetic strips into the bills. He was the first one to do that, by the way. Each time the cash was returned to a bank, the money would be taxed at a predetermined rate. So now they can track your cash. That would discard, which tells me that those strips in the, in the 
and I never knew this, but reading between the lines, it tells me that those strips have numbers on them. So that each individual $100 bill is, could be tracked by that strip. The strips are not the same. They're probably, they probably have the serial number of the bills on them. Now I'm guessing there. That would discourage individuals from hoarding cash and remove one obstacle for central bankers in setting ne negative rates. Negative interest rates are employed to incentivize, incentivize banks to lend money more freely and businesses and individuals to invest, lend and spend money rather than pay a fee to keep it safe. So basically, however, it's little more than theft. Instead of paying you interest on your money you give them, how many of you know you're not getting interest? Put $75,000 in the bank, wait for the first quarter interest and you'll get 0.03 cents. That's the way it works, negative interest rates. Uh, so however, it's little more than theft. Instead of paying you interest on the money you give them to store and subsequently use as reserve to make these loans, when banks are strapped for cash, they call the theft of your money negative interest rates. Goodfried is an advocate of bo for both negative interest rates and tracking your cash. And this person is about to have a leadership position inside America's central bank. Um, basically, under the idea of, re of reducing quantitative easing, Goodfrey will apply a tax directly to cash. That means if you have cash, he'll tax it, uh, stealing money from already taxed dollars by tracking who's using it. According to Goodfrey, U.S. currency should include tracking devices that let the government tax private possessions of dollar bills for your own good, of course. Uh, he, the magnetic strip could visibly record when a bill was last withdrawn from the banking system. So now they're going to add to that magnetic strip. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, the idea of tracking cash with magnetic strips or RFID chips is such a hor horrific idea that two unlikely senators from opposite sides of the, of the aisle have come forward to, to uh, vehemently oppose the, the good free appointment. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, and she's a Democrat, and a very vocal one, she's opposed to it, and so is Rand Paul. Um, they denounced Goodfrey's idea and they now put the nomination in jeopardy, which I think is a very good idea. This guy does not need to be nominated. Somebody say amen. All right, let me give you a little bit about war. And by the way, I know you heard that on CNN yesterday. I understand that they told you that. No, they didn't. All right, let me tell you, they don't tell you anything like that. Let me tell you about war. China and Russia military buildup challenges U.S. dominance. Uh, the world is now in a second Cold War among the major world powers, and the massive arms race is gearing up on all sides. Both China and Russia are preparing to challenge the United States' air superiority, as well as naval uh, dominance in the Pacific. They are making good progress in finding ways to counter U.S. nuclear capabilities, confront the U.S. space advantage, and wage cyberware on an unprecedented scale. Uh, let me just sum this up and tell you some other things that I know. Russia is putting all of its money into its military. They just came out today announcing that they have a Sidewinder missile that none of our, none of our radar can pick up, that it's a killer, on a, a U.S. killer. Now, there's a couple reasons why Russia does it. Number one, Russia is totally bankrupt. Their economic system is down the tubes. They're never going to recover from it. It's horrible. They've got to have a war to recover. And so they're putting all their money in the military. There's a couple reasons why they've said that today. President Trump has just said that he's going to undo what President Obama did uh, four years ago. He took all of our nuclear missiles off of our battleships and he took them all off of some ports and, our, and Trump, this is one good thing, he's putting them back on. And so to put those back on, Russia has to do some bravado. So Russia's doing a couple things. Putin's up for election and I'm hoping we could fix it and elect Donald Trump in Russia. But um, <laughs> we'll have to look at the inquiry and the probe that goes into that. But. Um, one of the things he's doing is obviously he has no, he's, he's losing at home. He just sent some mercenaries into, into, uh, into Syria and the United States wiped them out. He, he uh, actually sent these secret mercenaries in to do some damage in, 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 uh, in Syria and the United States Special Forces killed every single one of them. And so basically he is losing face at home and he's having an election coming up. Forget the fact that he's probably going to fix it, but he has to so, show something that's a bravado. How many are getting this? So he's telling them they have these new, whether he has it or not, we don't know. We do know the arrow system was developed because of the rumors of that. China, on the, on the other hand, is making, is, has a equivalent of our F-22 jets. They've, they reversed engineered it. They have them. They have a whole bunch more than we do. China is coming on strong. So when we talk about China and Russia, they are gearing up. They are gearing up a lot. The Bible talks about China being the king of the East. Its territorial ambitions are being felt in the South China Seas right now. But its naval buildup is on the sa is a scale difficult to fathom. It's so large. In just four short years, China has added the naval tonnage equivalent to the entire British Royal Navy. Uh, the Type 55 cruiser, 
A match for any NATO warship is under production, and the fleets of new submarines, destroyers, and even light carriers have made China a major naval power virtually overnight. Uh, the world's largest amphibious aircraft, the Chinese AG-600, is the size of a 737. The first crafts have already been spotted leading in, in, uh, landing in South China Sea, and at least 17 more are in production. Now China, on the other hand, opposite of, of Russia, is economy is booming. Their economy is absolutely unbelievable. Today, this week, President Trump's putting tariffs on aluminum and steel uh, so that China can't bring them in. And he's getting a lot of flack, obviously. But China is gearing up. Now, think about it prophetically. The Bible talks about the kings of the East, which are China, and it talks about the Gog and Magog, which is Russia and its leader. So we're watching these two nations start to come to power. Let me just give you something else that's kind of throw you for a loop. I mentioned a long time ago, and maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. I just finished reading a book called The, uh, the, um, the Thucydides Effect. Thucydides was a Greek philosopher who said this. He was talking about Sparta and, and, um, and Athens. They were city-states that were opposed to each other. Athens was very powerful, but Sparta was, its economy was coming up, and they were sitting there as a challenge to them, and he is saying his theory was there's going to be a war when you have a nation that is the leader of the world, or a city that's the leader of the world, and, it, and it's been leading for a long, long time and gets lax and it kind of lays back, and its competitor cities or nations start to build up. We are watching it happen right now. He said 15 times in history, the history of mankind, has that happened, and that nation that was secondary came up and overthrew the first one. How many of you get this? A powerful, powerful uh, book. And so the Thucydides effect is right now in full bloom in our world. You see Russia and China, and they are the ones that have been subverted and put down by United States supremacy, and they're rising, and we have presidents, unfortunately, in our, op in, our, in our highest office that started to make America weak. And so basically what's going to happen is we're going to be challenged. And that's right down the line with what scripture says about Russia and China rising. So how many of you get that? That's a lot to tell you, but how many of you got it? Yeah. All right, that's in short, so I want you to understand that. Let me give you a little bit more about war. Now, by the way, that was that one about Russia and China. And uh, somebody said to me, I just, want to, I just want to address this too. I get lots of email uh, in the, from all over the world, Brian just told me we're almost we're close to a million viewers, and uh, basically we have I've had some people that have have kind of told me that uh, that certain things they disagree with. Obviously, there's a lot of people who agree, but there's certain things that disagree with. So at the end of this one, I'm going to address one of the viewers, so I don't have to write to him. All right, so let me give you this one. Uh, he said, "Well, I'll do it now." He said this. He and I don't know who he was. I remember his name, but I don't have it offhand. But he said that uh, I'm wrong in telling about telling you that uh, Assad has killed a lot of people. The Syrian government has killed a lot of people. He said that's that's nonsense. He says, uh, "Where do you have any proof of that?" So if you're listening out there, which I'm sure you are, to catch me, there's your proof. This is the Syrian civilians killed from January to July of 2015. The lowest six-month period that they were killed, by the way, lowest number of deaths. You can see over here on unidentified, we don't know who killed them. The bl dark blue is males that they killed, the, the, the black are children. On the right-hand side, that's, we don't know who killed them. International coalition, that's how many they killed, it's less than, a, less than 100. The armed opposition groups, that's males, that's females, the light blue, and then children. The armed opposition groups are factors that are in there. They killed that many, less than 1,000. You had ISIS kill that many. And then you had the Kurdish forces, which haven't killed that many, but they're all men. And now look, there's the government forces. That's Bashar al-Assad's forces. He is killing his people in mass. He's killing men, he's killing women, he's killing children. So when you write to me, do your homework, do your research. Find out what you're talking about. I'm not just saying things here. I'm telling you that this is what's going on. These are men, women, and children. He is slaughtering his people. Assad has to go. Somewhere down the line, he has to go. He is the prime, more than, look how much more than ISIS. So he is slaughtering people. So I hope that answers your question. If you feel free to, to ask other ones, but uh, basically just do your homework so, you can, so I don't have to do this. You ready? All right, let me go a little bit further. Does jihad really have nothing to do with Islam? Uh, recently, U.S. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster once again downplayed the significance of faith by claiming the Islamic ideology is irreligious. So McMaster, going against Donald Trump, has said this. He says, no, it's not about religion. It is about religion. You cannot say that this is not about religion. This article is and it's an excellent article. It takes a reporter and it talks about the, somebody, the NSA, NS, excuse me, the NSC director on February 23, three days after his appointment, uh, McMaster said jihadist terrorists are not true to their professional religion. Of course they're true. They're truer to their religion than anybody else. They are taking jihad 
God as a, as a direct command from Allah. They're taking it right from the Quran. You cannot tell us that there is that separate from the Quran. It's telling them, go murder the infidels. The Quran says that. I can show you the surah where it says it. So McMaster needs a course in Islam. Amen. Because every Islamic terrorist is founded in its strong belief in Islam. They're, they are the radicals of Islam. So he says that's not really Islam. Of course it is. Islam has a, has a decree to subdue the world. You either subdue it through peace, which they don't know, or you, subdue, or you, or you tax people and get them out of an area, or you, take, or you take their lives. And this is the whole mindset of Islam. So to, to divorce yourself from that is really not right. Uh, lamenting the lack of education given to government officials about radical Islam, a reporter by the name of Higgins, who's been writing about Islam, wrote this, National security officials are prohibited from developing a factual understanding of Islamic threat doctrines, preferring instead to depend on the fifth column Muslim Brotherhood culturally advisors. Muslim Brotherhood in America are just tote themselves as very peaceful. They just want everybody to be happy. And that's fine, but inside your religion you have Islamic jihadists. Uh, Higgins stress on the lack of education about Islam is a vital recognition that something has been going wrong for years when it comes to American and European official responses to the religion and its followers. So here's my suggestion. My suggestion is every single Every single Republic, every single representative, House of Representative member, every single senator, every single national security advisor, every single department of, of the government, no matter who's in charge, should take a course on religion. They need to find out what religions are peaceful and what religions aren't. Before they make statements, they need to understand what they're talking about. All right, do I seem like I'm on a roll today? I am. All right, I'm rolling. All right, I'm not going to read the rest of that. I just told you my thoughts and... Obviously, my thoughts are my thoughts. All right, let me give you this one. This is pretty interesting. This is on religion. How, so how many remember about um, the Views woman who's talked about, Mike, about my, our Vice President Mike Pence and that he's crazy because he listens to God? So an article came out uh, this week and it says this. Yes, Christians do hear God's voice. Call me crazy. Uh, it says, a Washington Post writer once said that the evangelicals are poor, ignorant, and easy to command. Well, at least he didn't say we were mentally ill. Until now, that is. On a recent segment of The View, I've told you this, Joe Bearer took the aim at Mike Pence's belief that God speaks to him. Responding to a comment by another host, Bearer said, it's one thing to talk to Jesus, it's another when Jesus talks to you. That's a mental illness, if I'm not correct, hearing voices. Uh, that's a sign of how ignorant elites truly are about beliefs and practices common to something like two billion Christians. He says, I actually find it surprising that Bearer, who claims to be Catholic, hasn't found time in her 75 years to learn a little more about prayer. Bear's comment outraged Americans from coast to coast. 25,000 people let ABC know what they thought of a network that allows an employee to sneer at the way other people practice their faith. Good for them. The next day, Bear responded to her critics with a sarcastic clarification, saying, I don't think Mike Pence is mentally ill, even though he says he's hearing voices. That's not an apology, by the way. Uh, it, uh, uh, to me, it sounds like it, it's a... Uh, like he says, I'd like to propose a solution. I invite Bear to spend some time looking into what Christians mean when they say they hear God's voice. And this is really good. She might start with writing of J.W. Warner Wallace, a senior fellow at the, at the Colson Center, and a piece he posted for Fox News. Wallace notes that when Christians say God spoke to me, they don't necessarily mean that God spoke audibly. Christians, he explains, believe the Bible is the word of God, and by reading it, we gain access to the mind of God. Now, I read that, and I thought, well, it's not, but it goes on. He points to 2 Timothy, which notes the Holy Scripture is God's, God breathed, and Hebrews 4, which says the word of God is living and active. Reading these verses, one could see how Christians might legitimately say, God spoke to me, he explains. Second, God can use wise and mature advisors that teach us about God's will, people who are, had invested long years reading and meditating over Scripture. Wallace writes that a believer who says God spoke to her may simply mean that one of God's children provided them with biblical wisdom. Third, God may speak to us through difficult experiences. As C.S. Lewis writes in his Problem with Pain, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. Fourth, God may indeed speak audibly to his followers. Many people have written about hearing God's voice in a crisis. And in my own case, God spoke to me through an amazing, mind-blowing dream. Bible-reading Christians know this. Open your Bibles and you'll find all kinds of examples of each of the ways God speaks to his people, audibly, through prophets, and through the written word. Finally, 
It's worth reminding the media that if Mike Pence is crazy for believing he hears God's voice, then so is George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, FDR, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, all who said they still listen for the still small voice of God. One wonders if Joy would make a similar comment about Oprah Winfrey and her de declining run for the office of 2000 due to her not hearing God saying, God, if you think I'm supposed to run, speak to me. So obviously you have Bear, who is a liberal, that's trying to push our liberal agenda. Let me give you a little bit more on what we're going on for war here and give you a couple things that's happening there. After 300, I'm going back, after 365 civilian deaths in Syria, this is the one I was telling you about, the UN calls to end monstrous annihilation campaign. So I suggest to that person who's written, by the way, and I don't mean to be sarcastic to that person, I just want to let you know that there's lots of evidence out there. If I say something, I'm not just saying it because I, because I have a certain lean. I'm saying it because I've done my homework. And there's lots of, the UN now is calling for something to stop in Syria because of Bashar al-Assad's killing and massing his murderous, they call him his a murderous annihilation annihilation campaign, I'm quoting. So I know it sounds like I'm overemphasizing this, but I just want you to understand that I don't want to just give articles just to give you articles and pick and hand pick them out. These are truths that I've seen. So at the end of this, I want to give you something lighthearted. Is that all right? Yeah. You ready for it? Yeah. All right. You sure? Yeah. I'm waiting. All right. Man survives fourth lightning strike. According to the National, it has nothing to do with prophecy, by the way. According to the National Weather Service, the odds of getting struck by lightning are 1 in 700,000. But for Carl Mize, the odds are much, much greater. Mize, University of Oklahoma physical plant worker, uh, has been struck four times, most recently earlier this month. And while lightning injuries can be serious and even fatal, Mize has suffered relatively minor injuries. injuries. I have a hole in my tennis shoe, the 45-year-old Mize told the early show uh, on his latest strike. As the, boot, as the bolt hit, he said his right foot bounced off the ground and his body tensed up. He then pulled off his tennis shoe and found his toes completely numb. Uh, he goes on and says this, we were repairing a water line break up on the north campus and a storm rolled by him pretty fast, he said. Mize was the acting supervisor of a crew of four using a backhoe to dig up a broken water line. His co-workers who knew his history saw lightning in the distance and began joking with him. Mize said co-worker Dennis Maddox told him, I'm getting away from you, and then walked away. Mize, who has worked on utility crews at OU for 23 years, laughed at Maddox's fear for about two seconds. Then the bolt hit. The guy that rides in the truck with me, he wants hazardous duty pay now. Um, when lightning hits, Mai says he hears a big clap of thunder and has seen flashes of blue flames. Mai says his heartbeat slowed after the latest strike, uh, complicating an existing heart condition. He spent four days at Norman Region Hospital and he had to go through a number of tests before being released. Mai's in, in, uh, introduction to lightning strikes came in 1978 when he was a young bull rider on a rodeo circuit. Mai was competing in Claremore, Oklahoma when a thunderstorm caused a delay. He grabbed the handle of his pickup just as the lightning struck it. Paramedics on the rodeo uh, grounds checked him and he refused to go to the hospital. He says, I was young and dumb then. On May 3rd, 1999, Mize was standing near a swing set at a relative's home in Lexington, watching turbulent weather in the distance. He had his hand on the swing chain. Uh, not the smartest thing in the world to do, he said. Lightning hit the swing set and knocked him back. On August 9th, 1996, he was repairing a street light at OU when lightning was hit, hit a nearby 40-foot pine tree, splitting the tree in half and knocking Mize unconscious. It hit the tree and went over into the street po light pole and knocked the top of it and followed the cable around to where I was working on it, Mize explained. Then when it hit me, I went through my arm and then back out my chest. When Mize returned to work, his coworkers gave him a hard hat with a lightning bolt painted on it. We have a lot of pranksters around here, he said. My suggestion for Mize is if you see rain coming, get in the house. All right, that's in the news for tonight. I'm going to ask the usher if they come forward.